Should we get started? Yeah? Okay, good. We are very exciting to welcome you to the second session of the Leading Edge Symposium. And today it's all about biochemistry and cancer. So thank you for joining us. This will be a one hour session moderated by Dr. Maria Maldonado, incoming assistant professor at UC Davis, and by myself, Dr. Simone Brixius Anderko, assistant professor at the University of Pittsburgh. So we will have four wonderful speakers who will deliver equally wonderful talks. And each talk will be 12 minutes and, they, um, and then there will be uh, three minutes of questions. Talks will touch on the role on RNA and metabolic enzyme in health and disease using omics, structural and chemical biolo biology approaches. You can put your question into the chat and uh, either Dr. Maldonado or I will read your question or you can unmute yourself or raise the hand after the respective talk. So without further ado, I'm introducing our first speaker, Dr. Chris Kenny. Dr. Kenny did a PhD at Northwestern University with Dr. Amy Rosenzweig and is now a Merck Fellow of the Damon Runyon Cancer Research Foundation at Harvard University with Dr. Emily Barkus at the Department of Chemistry and Chemical Biology. Grace, we are very much looking forward to your talk. There we go. So hopefully you can see slides, you can hear me, and I have a little laser pointer. Okay. Then without further ado, uh, I am in fact Grace Kenny, and I'm here to talk to you today about identifying new metalloins on families involved in natural product biosynthesis. So first of all, why new enzyme families? Well, it turns out they're actually sort of hard to avoid. So if you look in the average genome, and this actually does apply to eukaryotes, but I'm focusing especially today on microbes, so bacteria and even archaea. Um, if you look in the average genome of a, of a species, you'll find genes encoding proteins, and these proteins can sort of broadly be categorized in three areas. Um, one set of proteins are proteins that have really clearly identified roles. We know pretty much exactly what they do. These are often, but not always, core metabolic enzymes. A second category are enzymes where you can give an overall function. We may know broadly what kind of chemistry they can more or less catalyze. We don't necessarily know the specific substrates or pathways they're involved in. Finally, there's a group of, of proteins that are more or less unknown. They're often called hypothetical proteins or predictive proteins, and we just don't know what they do. Depending on the genome, between a third and two thirds of all the proteins fall in these latter two categories. And what that means is there's a massive pool of microbial chemistry that's totally untapped. These are, you know, these are proteins that might be useful for biocatalysis, bioengineering, but these are also proteins that might be involved in chemicals, uh, making chemicals that are interesting, things like antibiotics or chemotherapy drugs. And that's actually what got me into my, my, my research career to begin with. Uh, working in the group of uh, Dr. Joanne Stubby at MIT, I studied uh, bleomycin bio. I studied uh, bleomycin. This is a complex microbial natural product, a uh, chemical produced by microbes as part of biological warfare between microbes. And as a budding chemist, I took I took a look at this and was just mind boggling. If I had mind boggling that bacteria could make this, well, I couldn't dream about making anything like this. Uh, and it turns out that when bacteria make bleomycin, they've got this huge complex set of proteins uh, involved in assembling uh, and manufacturing this compound. Once made, bleomycin folds up in a complicated 3D structure curled around a metal, in this case, an iron. Uh, with the iron installed, bleomycin can act, like, can act like a mini enzyme, catalyzing chemistry, in this case, DNA damage, which is why it's in use as a chemotherapy compound. So this project really combines a few areas that ended up defining my future research career, metals and biology, enzymes and microbial natural products. And all of the above featured in my graduate work in the Rosenzweig Lab Northwestern. So the Rosenzweig uh, group works on methanotrophs, bacteria that, meth that oxidize methane to methanol. That's their sole and only carbon source, no sugars, no nothing. Uh, to do this, they often have two entirely separate uh, systems for methane oxidation because they need a fail safe. Uh, SMMO is an iron dependent uh, methane monooxygenase. PMMO depends on copper. PMMO is preferred when available, and thus these bacteria have a really high need for copper. They have fancy copper acquisition systems, including, perhaps most famously, methanobactin. 
Simifanobactin is another complex microbial natural product. Uh, peptidic with a few non-peptidic peptidic components binds copper with high specificity and affinity. When I joined the Rosenzweig group, that's all we knew. There were these methane monooxygenase systems. We figured methanobactin was probably a copper acquisition system, but the details were all opaque. And this is what I spent my PhD, my PhD career uh, trying to clarify, working with lab mates and external collaborators. Uh, first, using transcriptomics and bioinformatics, I was able to elucidate the core components of the, bio, of the uh, methanobactin gene cluster and unravel methanobactin biosynthesis. We know a little bit about how methanobactin is probably exported and a lot more about how once it binds copper, it is imported actively back into the cell. We've identified some of the proteins probably involved in handling it in the periplasm and releasing copper from the internalized methanobactin. And we've also learned a lot more about the uh, copper machinery in the periplasm, much of which is ultimately involved in getting copper to PMMO. Finally, we've even started to understand the complex regulatory pathways that govern this hugely complicated set of systems. Uh, and obviously we've gone from not knowing very much to knowing a great deal more. Um, now I'd like to draw special attention to biosynthesis. So I mentioned a gene cluster. The methanobactin gene cluster looks like this. And a gene cluster uh, is a common feature in microbes where genes that have related roles uh, that are often co-regulated are, co are literally clustered together in the genome. So this small black gene here, MBNA, encodes a 30 amino acid peptide. This peptide is post-translationally modified by these proteins, MB and B and C, in an oxidative process, transforming a cysteine into an oxazolone or neighboring thioamide. There's often additional tailoring reactions before uh, methanobactin is eventually reduce, reduce, uh, released from the cell to bind copper. So MB and B and C are some of these hypothetical proteins I mentioned. When we started working on them, it wasn't clear what on earth they were doing. And so over the course of my PhD, I was able to not just identify the reaction that was catalyzed, but to identify potential active sites, a diet or possibly tri-iron site, and there's been since been some lovely crystallographic work uh, and mechanistic work starting to investigate these details. But that all happened here at the end of my PhD or the case of structural work after. Um, and that's really stuff I wanted to explore more as a postdoctoral researcher. I wanted to get into chemistry earlier and learn how to do some of those things myself. And so I joined the group of Emily Balskis. Uh, the Balskis group does a lot of work in microbial chemistry, including among other things, the biosynthesis of natural products containing nitrogen-nitrogen bonds. So I've illustrated a bunch of these natural products in this slide. I just wanna emphasize many of them are quite important. Uh, the ones in pink are chemotherapeutic agents. The ones with yellow labels are antibiotics. The ones in gray have other uh, very interesting biological roles. But until about half a decade ago, we had no idea whether these things shared a biosynthetic pathway, different pathways, unclear. As it turns out, biology loves coming up with new ways to make nitrogen nitrogen bonds. There's now at least a half a dozen distinct systems for, uh, making, the, for making these kinds of chemical groups. And I started out by investigating this process in phosphocytomycin lomifidocin. Brief spoiler, I've, I've, identified, I've identified the proteins that do this, and in fact, some other natural products that use the same system. But how did I get started in this? Well, the Balskis group is working on kinomycin and lomifidocin. Uh, and you don't need to be a chemist to see that these guys had some pretty similar chemical groups. The van der Donk group at UIUC was working in phosphocytomycin, which looks very, in fact, entirely different, except that it also has an NN bond. Now, the two groups both realize that there's a shared set of genes uh, in the gene clusters of these compounds. And since literally nothing else is shared but the NN bond, the hypothesis is obviously maybe these were involved in NN bond formation. They identified an early intermediate after which the NN bond already existed, uh, l hydrazine of succinate. We were able to show the NN bond is essentially passed from protein to protein before installation on the final compound. But the NN bond forming enzyme remained opaque. The candidate was KinJ, encoded in all these gene clusters, but it was one other, another one of these hypothetical proteins. Now, Abraham Wayne, the Vanderdonk group, was able to show it has a heme cofactor, uh, giving us the first information to, uh, uh, to work with. You may be familiar with heme from hemoglobin. It often catalyzes redox chemistry. But at this point, his luck, you know, his luck uh, ran out. Uh, Kin J was not active. And at that point, I just joined the Balsas group and I was willing to take on a project so he could graduate. And I started with bioinformatics. So I took a look at the genomic neighborhood of these Kin J genes. 
And what I noticed is the vast majority of them encoded a ferrodoxin, a small electron transporting gene, uh, protein um, somewhere near kin J. So this is interesting because we have this potential redox cofactor in electron transporting protein. Maybe they were partners. So I co-express them. You can put a tag on either protein and they'll pull each other down. Um, when you look at size exclusion chromatography to co-express proteins, you'll see a shift from monomeric kin J to the heterodimeric kin IJ. So yes, they're partners, they're buddies. This was really exciting. And this made me want to charge ahead and try some actual experiments to see if I could get protein activity with this new protein complex. So I expressed the proteins anaerobically because oxygen will harm ferrodoxins. I analyzed most of my reactions with mass spectrometry, although I've also know that we've also used some other spectroscopic techniques. And excitingly, when I provide both substrates, a source of electrons and both proteins, I see production of l succinate with the NN bond. Take away key components, like for example, the ferrodoxin, and I see no production. In other words, we've correctly identified the NN bond forming enzyme. Uh, with modeling uh, the inevitable alpha fold model, uh, I, we now know a possible protein fold for the family a consistent binding site for the ferrodoxin partners, and combined with mutagenesis experiments, spectroscopy experiments, uh, uh, experiments with uh, homologs, we've identified a possible active site, not just the heme cofactor, but uh, residues involved in stabilizing the, uh, the substrates. So we're currently starting to look at mechanism, but I actually want to focus my last, the, the end of my talk, about some exciting future directions. So I've been focusing on the KinJ uh, that it's literally from the kinomycin gene cluster, but there's all these other kinJ homologs. So taking a look at the genomic neighborhoods, I've 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 clustered these kinJ sequences according to the similar the similarity of their biosynthetic gene cluster. Over here, I've clustered them according to the similarity of the protein sequence. What we see is that very similar kinJs belong to very different gene clusters. Most of those gene clusters are entirely unrelated to the fossil xenomycin, kinomycin, and lomibidicin systems, which is really exciting. It means there's, a lot, again, a lot of untapped and in bond containing uh, compounds out there. So investigating one of them as a proof of concept, uh, I found a species that produces uh, negamycin, this small natural product, which is discovered in 1970. It's an antibiotic. It's also a candidate muscular dystrophy treatment. Um, but in the last 50 years, we never figured out how it was made. But taking a look at this KinJ homolog, I looked at the genomic neighborhood, identified a potential biosynthetic pathway, came up with a pretty detailed prediction, and working with my excellent undergraduate palace, been able to really begin to elucidate the not just confirm that this is in fact the right gene cluster, it is, but also to confirm uh, the roles of these various enzymes. And we can look beyond just these existing natural products. We can start to predict entirely new natural products. Uh, like this extensively modified hydrozido, hydrozido hexapeptide, um, or this uh, two three dihydroxybenz uh, uh, dihydroxybenzoic acid derivative, again with an internal NN bond. So I think from all this you can get a sense of what I'm really interested in: new microbial chemistry with special eye towards natural products and new enzymes. And in my future independent research career, I'm hoping to establish product uh, several projects that all exist in this space. What I'm interested in looking at is a new class of peptidic natural products. I'm interested in looking for metallophores in the, in, in, the, in the human microbiome, especially the human gut microbiome, things like methanobactin, potentially for different metals as well, um, that might be playing some really interesting roles in the microbiome. I'm hoping to look at some post-translation post modified proteins involved in metal stress, and also just involve, in, investing in several systems of protein families that I think misannotated, doing more exciting chemistry than, we, than their annotations would have you believe. Uh, but that's all the future. First, uh, to get there, I need to thank all the people who've gotten me here to begin with. That includes, of course, the Balsks group, Rosenzweig group, and the Stubby group, among others. Special thanks, of course, to my collaborators within labs and also in other groups. My funders, they've been running the Cancer Research Foundation and grad school in the AHA and leading reg program for inviting me to talk. And with this, I'll take any questions. Thank you so much, Grace, for this wonderful talk. Exciting. So please put your questions in the chat, in the chat or raise your hand or just unmute, you, unmute yourselves. Perhaps I can start. I have a question. <laughs> so many microbial species have actually really 
different redox proteins, like not only ferridoxin, but also flavodoxins and CP, like yep. reduct uh, reductases, which have multiple um, domains. Is there anything else clustered with KinJ so that you can really conclude that this is the like the physiological redox partner for this particular protein? Um, the only consistently present uh, redox, uh, redox proteins are all specifically for iron for sulfur cluster ferredoxins. Mm -hmm. With one exception, there's a little sub subgroup that has flavodoxins present. Mm -hmm. um, I have not been able to get those guys to express yet. Uh, so TBD on whether or not that's actually on whether or not they're actually playing the same role um, in real life, but it's definitely intriguing. It might have some hints about the redox potential range these enzymes are functioning in. Yes, that's super exciting. Thank you. Um, anybody else has a question? Oh. Hey, um, yeah, so I'm, yes. yeah, yeah, thank you. So I'm struggling to phrase this correctly, but given that you've done all this uh, bioinformatics analysis, I wonder, in these gene clusters, do you ever see instances of a little bit of predicted divergence? Can you perhaps identify, for instance, like here's a complex that you've all characterized and here's a nearby one that might make a different product or something like that, kind of broadening your analysis around each of these clusters? Absolutely. And so that's, and so that's actually been one really nice. So I sort of breezed by this, but I've actually developed some, bio, some bioinformatics tools explicitly to explore these kinds of gene clusters. And what's nice things is they make it really, really easy to sort of identify those divergent subgroups and sub subgroups. Um, so you can actually see there's a, there's a, the lomivitacin, kinamycin, and fluostatin, which I hadn't quite into, are all a bunch of related uh, diazobenzofluorine, benzofluorine natural products. And you can actually start to track some of the evolutionary divergence, the rearrangements that go into the differences between those, comp uh, between those pathways. And it makes it easy to identify a new set of pathways and say, okay, this is probably a benzofluorine, but it's not one of these existing three classes. Um, is it potentially consistent with, any other, with, with, you know, with something new or is it just a rearrangement? Um, and I think that's, this, this is something that comparative genomics and genome mining are making you know, both easier, but also more, you know, perhaps more intimidating. It's just like the sheer mass of data we now, we, you know, we now have to look through. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. it, 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 it's becoming very clear that, you know, what we thought was maybe one kind of natural product is an entire family of natural products and intermediates. Yeah, awesome. No, it seems like in addition to the ever-present helpful fold, it's like, well, are you going to need to start throwing machine learning at that too? So yeah, no, really like saying stuff. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, no, I, it, it, currently hoping to learn more about machine learning myself so I can make better and fancier versions of my own bioinformatics tools as well. <laughs> awesome, thank you so much again, Grace. And I will hand over to my co-moderator, Dr. Maldonado. Maldonado. Thank you, Simone, and uh, thank you, Grace, for a great talk. Um, our next speaker is Dr. Meghna Gupta. Dr. Gupta did her PhD at Jawaharlal Nehru University and is now a specialist in Stroud Lab at the Department of Biochemistry and Biophysics at the University of California, San Francisco. So, uh, Meghna, please uh, go ahead. Uh, we look forward to your talk. Hi, uh, can anyone, everyone hear me? Yeah, thank you. Hi everyone, uh, today I'll be talking a little bit about uh, my work on peroxisomal fatty acid transporter and what I have learned from it so far. What are peroxisomes? So peroxisomes are single membrane organelle in our cells and they are very, very amenable to any cues, environmental cues or metabolic cues in the cell. And they are part of many, many different metabolic pathways, including fatty acid metabolism. And one of the key role, which most of the people know about is scavenging free radicals, as it has abundant amount of catalase inside uh, these uh, single membrane organelles. And to serve this diverse role of peroxisomes, they often interact with other organelles of the cell and participate in metabolic exchange or just physical contact. 
when there is an imbalance in the paroxysmal metabolism, it results in many different diseases. And a large part of it is not very well understood that how these diseases are getting manifested. So I started with the fatty acid oxidation part of understanding paroxysms. So paroxysms are a hub of many different coenzyme A-based reactions. And as you can see, in addition to fat, various fatty acid metabolism pathways, it also takes part in bile acid metabolism and many ether-linked lipid biosynthesis pathways, which results in metabolites like plasmo plasmalogens, et cetera. Why paroxysomal fatty acid metabolism is important. So when we talk about beta oxidation in the cell, most of us focus on mitochondria. While before us working on this project, even I was unaware of that, what is the exact role of peroxisomes? Our cells produce very long chain fatty acids and branch chain fatty acids as part of different pathways. But there are not many ways to metabolize these types of fatty acids. Peroxisomes actually shorten the length of these very long chain fatty acids and cut off the branches of branch chain fatty acids and make uh, substrates which are uh, good to go by, via the mitochondrial fatty acid metabolism pathway and result in energy production. A lot of our energy intensive cells and tissues in the body rely on fatty acid metabolism as a source of their energy. I was interested in looking at the gateways of these fatty acids into the peroxisomes, which are mostly ABC transporters. ABC transporters are ubiquitously present on various organelles as well as our plasma membrane. And to have a fully functional transporter, you need two sets of transmembrane domains and two sets of nucleotide binding domains. While the peroxisomal ABC transporters exist as half transporters, so they need to heterodimerize or homodimerize in order to form a fully functional transporter. I started with ABCD3, which is one of the peroxisomal ABC transporter. The reason was because it is one of the most abundant and has a diverse substrate range. So I thought I will get a broader window of understanding these transporters. So in this overall project, I wanted to understand the conformation map and what is the mechanism of substrate transport using structural biology as a tool. Uh, for this transporter. Then I wanted to characterize biochemically that how the substrate is transported through the transporter. The third aim, which was even broader, what I started with was looking at the various complexes on the surface of peroxisomal uh, membrane. And one of the project which came as a serendipitous discovery in collaboration with Walter Lab was that we discovered new uh, interactions via ABCD3 between peroxisome and ER. So as usual, like for structural biology, I started with extracting the protein with detergent. Uh, the protein purified beautifully. We were able to get a wild type structure and the outcome of it was that it makes a homodimer. At that time, this was the first structure of the protein, but uh, I will tell you why it is still unpublished. And in the meantime, there were published structures of ABCD1, which corroborated with what we had in hand at that time. And we proved that uh, ex the detergent extracted human ABCD3 is ATP is active, which is a good sign. And one of the usual routes to obtain various confirmations of ABC transporter in the field is to mutate this Walker B motif glutamate to glutamine. And what happens that ATP binds but doesn't get hydrolyzed. It results in change in conformation because ATP uh, binds, but it cannot hydrolyze. So the transporter doesn't reverse back to inward open conformation. 
I got the structure, but I did not see a confirmation change. And that was a surprise. But one uh, very uh, exciting thing at that time we saw was there was something in the substrate binding cavity. So at that time, we assumed that probably some fatty acid or equivalent substrate is being co-purified during the purification, and it is trapped in the substrate binding pocket. We were able to fit coenzyme A, and sometimes as it happens that when we read the literature, we hypothesize as we are working. And one of the hypotheses in the field, so it has been proven in plant orthologs and to some extent human, human uh, orthologs as well, that uh, it, this transporter has thioesterase activity. So while it is transporting the substrate, it splits the fatty acid and the coenzyme A. Why it does that? not known. So uh, the resolution at that time was somewhere around 3.9, 4, and we were able to fit coenzyme A in the uh, central pocket of it. And then we observed that very next to it, there is a fatty acid-like looking density. And at the base of it, there was a cysteine. So it made sense that possibly there's a fatty acid covalently linked to the cysteine and probably we are seeing thioesterase activity in action. Though, yes. we, were, Maybe. though we were able to uh, show thioesterase activity in vitro as well by supplementing uh, an external substrate phytonoil coenzyme A, we still were chasing this question that why don't we see a, a confirmation change in the presence of ATP in this mutant? Uh, and we were in parallel trying to understand the existing structure better. So we collaborated with Zikiang Guan uh, at uh, Duke University, but we didn't see any fatty acid covalently linked to the C99. And we also gave them a mutant for analysis, which was cysteine to serine mutant. So I thought, okay, let's see what happens to this mutant when we do not add ATP. We were able to get a nice structure. And we were also able to get a high, slightly higher resolution of the existing structure with ATP. The only difference between these structures was presence of this extra density in the center. So now it even puzzled us more that if it was co-purifying a fatty acid, it should anyway do that. Adding or not adding ATP should not affect that. But since we had a slightly better resolution and these are the nucleotide binding domains, these, are, these were not that well resolved, but the transmembrane area was uh, at a much better resolution under three angstroms. And uh, to our surprise, actually the C99 residue, what we were assuming has a fatty acid covalently linked to it, uh, had density in both in the absence and presence of ATP. So we were able to fit ATP in the central density. And as you see that ATP and coenzyme A are very similar uh, uh, parts of them. So we further uh, you know, looked into the literature that can it transport, uh, so we see the kind of binding, but can it transport ATP? So we were able to find one publication where in addition to the yeast transporter, uh, this group actually put a human ABCD transporters as well into the Saccharomyces cerevisiae, and they were able to show that it does transport ATP. So it is, it is, you know, to our surprise, we never assumed it will, and a transporter will consume ATP to transport ATP, but uh, ABC transporters are usually known to transport a wide variety of substrates. So. Peroxisomes actually carry out a lot of activities where they utilize ATP, but the transporter which transports ATP into the peroxisomes is not very well known. And ABCD3 could be one of those transporters which are bringing ATP in, into the peroxisomes. So we are in the process of obtaining high resolution structures with coenzyme A and fatty acyl coenzyme A and other substrates and possible transport assays. 
to further elucidate the mechanism of these transporter. Uh, and the second part of the project, as I mentioned in uh, one of the previous slides, is that we were looking at higher order structures at the peroxisomal membrane. And uh, one of the interesting chaperone, PEX19, is actually a soluble protein. And it literally binds to the, kind of holds the hand of this membrane protein and inserts it in the peroxisomal membrane with the uh, help of PEX3, which is an anchor. So we were able to actually reconstitute this complex by in vitro farnesylating PEX19. And we see some extra density in, in our map, but uh, we're still working on it. And I'm trying to image peroxisomes across scales, uh, be it light microscopy or cryo-ET to understand these complexes uh, in a larger con context. And as I mentioned, our serendipitous discovery. So this proves the power of collaboration that how we can uh, you know, discover totally different things while, <laughs> while having a one vision in hand. Uh, so in addition to this particular project, which I will be taking to my own lab, uh, I have worked on many different projects in the Stroud lab. And I was lucky to contribute and publish uh, a wide variety of structures. And very thankful to Bob Stout and a lot of lab members who have helped me along the way. Uh, three visionary scientists who have, who have managed to run a very uh, inclusive UCSF EM facility, UCSF and Bay Area Cryo EM community, many different training programs, my co-mentors, Peter and Adam, uh, UCSF OCPD, and part of the various committees, which makes me think about science with a broader perspective. And I am currently uh, on my K99 fellowship from NIA. And I am very, very thankful to Leading Edge Fellows Program. And I'm in the academic job market. So any questions, let me know. Thank you very much, Magna. That was a really interesting talk. Um, are there any, maybe we have time for one, one question. Are there any questions? Uh, yes, James Letts, if you would like to unmute yourself. Hi, uh, really fantastic talk. Uh, thank you. Uh, I was just wondering about the stoichiometry of the ATP transport. It's using ATP to transport ATP. Do you know what the stoichiometry uh, of the transport would be? So we are still working on it. The transport assays are not done yet, but one of the example in the literature is PEX34, which is primary transporter for FAD and coenzyme A, but it also transports ATP. So what I personally think is that ATP is more like something which fits in the substrate binding pocket and gets transported. But, but is, are, two, are two molecules transported in one transport event? Yeah, but also okay. hydrolysis. Uh, so at least two ATP molecules bind in the nucleotide binding domains. So the hydrolysis event, how it happens and how it transports, I think will take more time for me to understand that. Thank you. Thanks, James. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Gupta. Uh, we can uh, move on to our next speaker, thank you. Hey, it is my great pleasure to introduce our next speaker, Dr. Tigis Tamir. Dr. Tamir did her PhD at University of Carolina Chapel Hill with Dr. Ben Major at the Department of Pharmacology and is now a postdoctoral associate at the Koch Institute for Integrative Cancer Research at, at MIT, working with Dr. Forrest White at the Department of Biological Engineering. Tigis, take it away. I'm excited to listen to your talk. Great, thank you very much for the introduction. Um, hopefully everyone can hear me. <laughs> um, hello everyone, I'm today gonna be talking to you about more um, about cell signaling and metabolism um, uh, with respect to the work we're doing using um, aspect-based proteomics. Um, so my, one of my main interests uh, is a kind of understanding how cells are able to uh, organize their response to the environment and specifically how we go 
from the proteome to the phosphoproteome where uh, there are post-translational modifications that control the outcome of metabolic enzymes, in particular changes in the metabolome that uh, promote um, cell growth, proliferation, and survival. And in the context of cancer, which is my main focus, um, I'm mainly interested in figuring out how do these processes get co-opted uh, by cancer cells to uh, increase um, their phenotype that allows them to survive um, and develop resistance to chemotherapy. And one of the main ways is that by altering uh, their metabolic responses to the environment, specifically by uh, deregulating the processes and uh, kind of using up new um, sources of energy, uh, resisting uh, cell death by altering uh, drug metabolism, um, as well as developing uh, mutations and resisting um, stress response. So in the white lab, we study phosphorylation, in particular, uh, phos uh, tyrosine phosphorylation. Uh, phosphorylation of proteins is a reversible modification for those uh, who are not familiar. Uh, it's performed by kinases uh, by the addition of phosphate group using uh, ATP. And, um, and the, pho the phosphoproteome is composed of phospho mostly phosphoserine, uh, phosphotrenine, and phosphotyrosine, which are the three residues uh, commonly phosphorylated, uh, where 90% of them are, are represented by uh, phosphoserine, 9% threonine, and a very low percentage, uh, less than 1%, uh, phosphotyrosine. So using integrative omics, um, the white lab um, has been um, kind of defining uh, alter signaling pathways in cancer. Um, and my main focus um, in my postdoctoral study is to define metabolic pathways that are altered in response to signaling. And uh, I'll be using um, mass spec-based proteomics uh, 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 by taking samples from uh, 2D cultures, uh, cell culture, uh, also mouse models and patient samples, and trying to use quantitative uh, phosphoproteomics and metabolomics uh, to better define new targets and understand uh, cancer cell response uh, to stress at the systems level. And by doing that, we're, we, uh, I will be able to uh, define pathways that are drivers of resistance to therapy, um, in particular, in, in particular uh, at the level of the phosphoproteome. So my main uh, question uh, that I'll be kind of discussing today is, does metabolic enzyme phosphorylation affect function? And if so, how? Um, when I say metabolic enzymes, we're interested in these seven classes of enzymes. Uh, so based on the published data so far, approximately 34% of uh, the published phosphoproteome uh, is observed on serine threonine and tyrosine residues found on enzymes in particular. And if we break down um, that 34% further into the different classes of enzymes, we see that um, there is a representation of oxidative bactases, transferases, hydrolases, uh, which make up the bigger majority of the group. Um, and I'm quite interested in understanding how oxidative bactase uh, phosphorylation uh, alters response to um, cancer chemotherapy. Um, the main thing to note here is that while tyrosine phosphorylation is less than 1% of the phosphoproteome, it does um, account for 10% of all uh, phosphorylated metabolic enzymes, which kind of makes up a bigger chunk. So my main approach has been trying to kind of take all of the published data, uh, thanks to the internet and <laughs> the tireless work that other scientists have done so far, uh, this data is available and we can kind of filter it down to a point where we can uh, see the big picture, but also define potentially new uh, targets of uh, uh, cancer therapy. In order to do that, um, I collected the data from uh, Phosphocyte Plus, which has the phosphoproteomics data available um, and uh, structural data from the protein data bank, and then also um, other sources, the Swiss prot uh, and Uniprot, uh, to better annotate um, this phosphorylation of tyros tyrosine on enzymes, and particularly looking at the structural makeup as well as the different pathways uh, these enzymes are involved in. Uh, first things first, looking at the pathway enrichment analysis, while well, we've uh, surprisingly noted is that most of the, uh, the enzymes that are tyrosine phosphorylated are actually involved in xenobiotic metabolism, 
uh, redox response, hypoxia, um, which are all generally things that cancer cells upregulate in order to resist therapy, specifically chemotherapy. Uh, and then the other uh, components are fatty acid, glycolysis, and adipogenesis associated enzymes, which um, allow cancer cells to adapt to a changing uh, availability of macromolecules in their hypoxic environment. So this was kind of very promising and led us to the next step, which was, well, what does this mean, uh, the structural and functional uh, part? So are these tyrosine phosphorylation sites on metabolic enzymes structurally and functionally relevant? In order to answer that, uh, we took this new filter data set um, and um, I asked what um, the, the two different questions uh, first, is, uh, can we use structural modeling to better understand what happens at the site of phosphorylation with respect to the enzymatic uh, function? Um, and here I'm kind of showing you an example. This is a G6PD, which is a linchpin uh, enzyme involved in the pentose phosphate pathway, where there is multiple tyrosine sites um, found in, the, in its cofactor binding site uh, interacting with NADPH, was, which is important for its analysis. Um, and then the second uh, approach is to use CRISPR-I mediated rescue experiments where uh, I express dead Cas9 and a guide RNA that would transcriptionally repress this uh, endogenous enzymes. And then we can overexpress either a phosphodeficient or phosphomimetic version of the enzymes and then track enzymatic activity using specific enzyme assays as well as targeted metabolomics. So looking at the structural um, data we, collect, uh, we collected, um, um, as you can note here, this is the breakdown of what, what, where the tyrosine sites are located. Um, so these phosphorylated sites are mostly located in active sites and nucleotide binding sites uh, for the majority of the proteins and some metal binding and some that look like they might be involved in uh, dimerization of um, the different subunits of uh, enzymes. Um, so this, was, this was super promising. Um, and, but the next question was, well, are all of these structures kind of good resolution, something we can use for the further molecular modeling uh, side of the question? Um, approximately 60% of the enzymes had really good resolution. Uh, here I'm showing you um, a density histogram where uh, on the y-axis is the resolution of these different structures and um, the density of how many of those structures actually um, were close to high resolution, which we would consider anything below uh, four angstroms. And out of the 21, over 2,100 structures are found on 332 enzymes, um, most of them seem to be within the right resolution for us to further study um, this enzymes. And then the other aspect is that the local resolution for these enzymes was also uh, much closer towards the two angstroms with a uh, difference of free and uh, uh, R value um, of being approximately below 0 0.05. So um, this was super interesting. And now we have very many enzymes to evaluate. Um, I kind of wanted to give you uh, an example just with your appetite and you know leave on a cliffhanger. Um, so one of the examples is actually GSTP1 or gluten uh, enzyme that binds glutathione and is phosphorylated on three distinct sites within um, the glutathione binding domain. Um, so it has multiple sites, multiple tyrosine sites here. I'm showing you uh, tyrosine 7, 64, and 109. And this has been so far published to be important for catal catalysis, specifically for uh, the presence of these tyrosine sites increases uh, the negativity of the um, binding domain. Um, but in terms of recording in progress, in terms of the sorry, <laughs> in terms of the relevance for cancer uh, therapy, um, multiple groups. I'm just showing you an example uh, here uh, of one, but multiple groups have developed inhibitors for uh, for GSTP1 in particular, where there's a co covalent modification that heavily relies on these tyrosine sites. Um, so it would be interesting to know what happens when these sites are phosphorylated, when there are drivers, uh, uh, oncogenic drivers that specifically phosphorylate sites such as um, epidermal growth factor. And then um, another study that also came out suggested that 
um, GSTP1 um, drives a triple a negative breast cancer um, metabolism and growth, and that using um, different types of uh, GSTP1 inhibitors uh, reduce um, cancer cell survival uh, in uh, T, uh, TNBC cells, but also reduce tumor burden in xenograft mouse models uh, when treated with this GSTP1 inhibitor. So this suggests that there is a potential for using these specific enzymes uh, for therapy. So the next step is going to be kind of defining what is um, the role of these tyrosine residues uh, with respect to interaction with cofactors, coenzymes, and substrates, and specifically if that is how they, uh, the phosphorylation events can uh, provide regulation of metabolic output. So, so far I've uh, told you about uh, tyrosine modification being important on metabolic enzymes, specifically with my interest of oxidoreductases and their uh, phosphorylation status in cancer cells. Um, the next steps would be to do molecular model modeling to determine what the importance of these uh, sites are for catalysis or changes in transition state of enzymes. Um, and then obviously the next questions are more of like the therapeutic approach. So does the gain or loss of these tyrosine sites alter their function? Um, and can we classify that? But also uh, what pathways are regulating this, uh, this specific enzymes, uh, uh, especially um, oxidoreductases that promotes resistance to therapy and are key players. And my plan uh, for my future work is to use this platform as well as additional uh, 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 additional mathematical modeling as well as molecular modeling to better define what it means for these sites uh, for these specific enzymes to be phosphorylated and whether that is something we can generalize over a group or class of uh, specific enzymes. And with that, I would like to thank my mentor, Dr. Forrest White. He's been such an advocate and a very <laughs> phenomenal mentor so far. Um, and I also want to thank the rest of the lab. They've been uh, very helpful and uh, uh, kind of provided a collaborative environment. And then I want to thank my two undergrads. They are phenomenal freshmen, <laughs> uh, Abia and Sabrina. They've, uh, Abia has been doing the computational work and Sabrina has been doing the experimental work with me. And it's been wonderful. And also the Koch Institute and the MIT Center for Precision Cancer Medicine um, have provided funding and also support. Um, and uh, my additional support started through the Boris Wilkham Fund PDEP program and the diverse, diversity supplement from NCI. And I would also like to thank the Leading Age program for giving me this opportunity. And with that, I'll take questions. Thank you so much, Tigis, for this wonderful talk. So we have time for a short question, maybe. So if you want to put your question in the chat or raise your hand. Okay, perhaps I have a short question, I've got a really, really short one. Um, do you think that when I'm wondering about active, oh, we have a question. I will give our, I will, yeah, I will read it to you. Hi, Tigis, it's from Connie Fong. Hi, Tigis, GSTP1 had three distinct phosphotyrosine sites. Are there any phosphoserine or threonine sites? Do proteins generally have a heterogeneous set of phosphorylated residues? Um, sorry, I didn't um, get the, the question. Uh, do proteins generally have heterogeneous? Oh, um, yes, they do. Um, so um, the main focus for the postdoctoral post side of my, my work is going to be on the tyrosine residues, but definitely this is also a, ob, um, obviously there for serine and threonine residues. Um, I think tyrosine residues currently are very interesting because uh, of the bulky aromatic group and the, them being not uh, structurally um, important um, for most of these enzymes. I, I hope I answered your question. Um, and do threonine and serine phosphorylation sites show a similar pattern for enrichment? Um, yes, they do. Um, however, um, most of the phosphorylation sites uh, that we see on serine and threonine are not within um, the uh, structurally relevant domains. Um, and um, there is definitely a percentage, but it's not as, um, I guess, robust as tyrosine size for the time being. 
Awesome, thank you so much. And I will hand over to Dr. Maldonado again to introduce the next speaker. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Um, our next and final speaker for the day is Dr. Christina Fitzsimmons. Dr. Fitzsimmons did her PhD at UCSF with Dr. Danica Fujimori and is now a postdoctoral fellow at the National Cancer Institute at NIH with Dr. Pedro Batista. Um, we look forward to your talk, Christina. Well, let me share my screen. Wonderful. Uh, can everyone see my slides? Excellent. Uh, well, thank you so much for the introduction. Uh, and as Maria said, my, my name is Christina Fitzsimmons. Uh, I'm currently a postdoc in the Batista lab uh, at uh, the National Cancer Institute. Uh, and I'm going to be talking to you today about uh, some of my postdoctoral work, looking at uh, the intersection of metabolism and RNA modifications in cancer, uh, as well as highlight some of the challenges that I would like to address in my independent lab. Uh, so each cell controls when and how its genes are expressed, uh, and this balance can be regulated at many levels. Uh, so coming from a, a chemistry background, uh, I became very interested in how small chemical modifications uh, to these macromolecules uh, affect uh, regulation of gene expression uh, and, and the roles they play in different cell types. Uh, so for example, at the level of DNA, uh, we know that modifications are critical for uh, DNA accessibility. Uh, we also heard a, a nice example uh, just a few minutes ago about the roles of uh, post-translational modifications, the roles of uh, protein phosphorylation and it, it plays in cells. Uh, and so here I'm going to be focusing on uh, the role of RNA modifications in cells. Uh, and in particular, one of the modifications that I'm really interested in is this uh, N6-methyl adenosine, or M6A. Uh, and I'll be representing it here throughout the talk as this kind of red lollipop cartoon. Uh, so what we know about M6A uh, is that it's the most abundant internal modification on mRNA, and it plays a, an important role in a number of downstream processes. Uh, so the functional consequences of this modification are modulated through RNA binding proteins, or readers. Uh, and as I said, this plays a role in a number of processes, including things like splicing, uh, protein translation, uh, and a number of uh, diseases. Uh, now, if we take a step back, this modification is installed. Uh, through the actions of a writer complex. Uh, and this writer complex uh, comprises the, the catalytic core uh, of metal three and metal 14. Uh, and this uh, complex uses the small molecule s uh, to uh, install the modification. Uh, and then finally, this modification can be uh, dynamically regulated and it can be removed through the actions of some of these eraser proteins. Uh, so these are things that uh, like FTO and alpha-H5 uh, which use uh, oxygen and alpha ketoglutarate uh, to remove the modification. Uh, now, of course, these modifications uh, and these processes don't happen in a bubble. Uh, and one of the things that I've been really interested in understanding is how cellular metabolism can impact these processes. Uh, so the availability of cellular metabolites can impact reactions. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, the writer complex uses s uh, to install the modification, uh, and the erasers use alpha ketoglutarate uh, to remove a modification. Uh, and the availability of metabolites can really change depending upon the conditions within a cell. Uh, and these metabolites are part of essential cellular pathways. Thus, you can imagine uh, if you dysregulate any of these pathways, uh, you can dysregulate uh, these enzyme processes. And so the question that I'm really trying to address here is what impact does altered metabolism have on M6A modifications? Uh, and so one of the places where we can study altered metabolism is in cancer. Uh, so altered metabolism is a well-characterized hallmark of cancer. Uh, and one of the ways that this can happen is through mutations to enzymes in the TCA cycle. Uh, these are mutations to isocitrate dehydrogenase, succinate dehydrogenase, or, or fumarate hydrogenase. Um, and you can see, in fact, that these TCA mutations are very widespread in a number of different types of cancer. Uh, and one of the things I want to highlight, although I don't have time to talk about today, is how certain mutations are more common in certain types of cancers. Uh, and the reasons for this are still somewhat unclear. Uh, but one of the things that we do know is that for all of these mutations, uh, mutations to these TCA enzymes will alter the metabolic flux of the TCA cycle and lead to a buildup of metabolic intermediates. Uh, and these uh, 
metabolic intermediates can have downstream effects on things like cellular growth, uh, signaling, uh, and what I'm interested in, which is this uh, metabolic epitranscriptomic crosstalk. Uh, and so today, I'm going to focus on the effects of mutations in renal cancer. Um, so as a model to study uh, this crosstalk, I've chosen to focus on uh, this renal cancer uh, that has mutations to fumarate hydratase. And this is a, a hereditary form of renal cell carcinoma. Uh, so previous research has shown that this renal cell carcinoma is highly aggressive, uh, that readily metastasizes. So all of these dark spots that you see on the PET scan are, are sites of metastasis in the patient. Uh, and even with extensive monitoring, uh, patient prognosis tends to be quite poor. Uh, so we have an immortalized cell line from these patients, uh, and this has a loss of fumarate hydrogenase. Uh, so I use this patient-derived cell line to create an isogenic pair of cells that contain either the mutant or the wild-type versions of fumarate hydrogenase, uh, and then use these cells to kind of ask questions about uh, this metabolic epitranscriptomic crosstalk. Uh, so by Western blot, when we look at these cells, uh, we can see similar levels of uh, fumarate hydrogenase expressed between our wild-type and our mutant cell lines. Uh, and then to further characterize the cells, I performed uh, metabolite mass spectrometry uh, to look at the levels of various metabolites. Uh, and we can see here, when we look at the level of fumarate, uh, the mutant cells have a similarly high level of fumarate as that of the parental cells, making them quite well matched. Whereas in our wild type rescue cells, uh, we have a very low level of fumarate, and this is comparable to other non-cancerous kidney cell lines. Uh, so now that we've kind of established the system, I can ask, how does accumulation of fumarate actually impact uh, the modification in our cells. Uh, so I performed RNA mass spectrometry, uh, measuring the levels of M6A in our cells. Uh, and I observed significant differences in, in the levels of M6A between the mutant uh, and the wild type cells. And these differences that we're seeing look small, uh, but they are in line with the levels of change that other people have seen uh, when they knock out the enzyme. Uh, so one of the questions that I had uh, was if changes in M6A also might be due to changes in the expression of the writers and the erasers. Uh, and in fact, we do not observe any changes in either the writer or the eraser expressions. This is kind of further supporting our hypothesis that fumarate is inhibiting uh, these erasers. Uh, now, you know, mass spectrometry is wonderful and it gives us a lot of information about the global changes. Um, but we really wanted to ask the question of how can we look at this in a more transcript specific way? Uh, so we performed M6A immune precipitation uh, to look at how these uh, M6A sites were changing on a more transcript level. Uh, so here I'm showing you a volcano plot, looking at changes in some of our high confidence M6A peaks. Uh, so of these approximately 19,000 peaks, uh, we observe around 1,100 of these here on the right-hand side um, that are upregulated in the mutant. And this corresponds to approximately 900 genes where we see changes. Uh, and then on the right-hand side, uh, there are about 450 peaks, which uh, again corresponds to about 300 genes uh, where we see changes in peaks. Um, interestingly, uh, these you know, 1,100 or so peaks have approximately 800 peaks that are found exclusively in the mutant cells, uh, while the rest are kind of shared between the wild type and the mutant. Uh, and so, of course, we were interested, what are these transcripts with changes in M6A? Uh, but when we look in greater detail at the M6A IP data, we observe a number of transcripts that are associated with uh, things like cellular adhesion, uh, actin-related processes, uh, including uh, peak changes in things like vimentin uh, and SNIL, which are known markers of this epithelial to mesenchymal transition. Uh, we also see changes in some of these uh, genes associated with signaling pathways, such as the AKT and the WINT signaling pathways. Uh, and now both of these are, are known targets of M6A and other cancers, uh, and these signaling pathways are also frequently dysregulated in cancers. Uh, so taken together, uh, you know, we think this might play a role in the development of, of these mesenchymal characteristics uh, and the aggressive phenotype that has been observed with this cancer. Um, and so, as I mentioned, we know that this hereditary kidney cancer is highly aggressive, uh, and we've actually been able to observe this in our isogenic cell line system using a transwell assay to measure invasion. Uh, so we plate cells in the top chamber of a well, uh, and after 48 hours, we can measure uh, cells that have invaded to the bottom. Uh, and so when you look here at the mutant cells in the presence of this chemoattractant, we see that the cells are very highly invasive. And of course, this is preliminary data, uh, but based on our IP results um, uh, and some of the things that we've been seeing with these uh, EMT phenotypes in the IP data, you know, we're really excited to kind of measure the impact of these M6A writers and erasers on some of these tumorigenic phenotypes. Um, so just kind of wrap up some of the, the work that I've told you about here today. 
Uh, I've told you that you know in this uh, system we observe M6A changes on a number of transcripts, uh, and a lot of these are associated with uh, EMT and signaling. Uh, so one of the things that I mentioned we're working on again right now uh, is looking at where we uh, knock out or overexpress the M6A writers and erasers, uh, and then measure the tumorigenic phenotypes and things like these wound healing or the invasion assay that I just mentioned. Uh, finally, you know these uh, enzymes have different sensitivities uh, to different metabolites. Uh, and as I mentioned, renal cell carcinomas, we see mutations in both fumarate hydrogen, uh, hydrogenase and succinate dehydrogenase. Uh, and so looking kind of at the molecular level uh, to compare uh, the signatures of these different renal cell carcinomas might help us gain some insight into some of this uh, metabolic crosstalk that we're seeing. Uh, and so, you know, I've spoken to you today about one modification uh, in one uh, cell type, uh, but in my independent research program, I'm really interested in continuing to explore this metabolic epitranscriptomic access. Uh, so we know, for example, that cells display a, a wide range of, of heterogeneity. Uh, and so how do changes in cells environment impact chemical modifications that are observed on RNA? Uh, so as I said, I mentioned uh, some of our work looking at uh, uh, FH uh, and SDH renal cell carcinomas, uh, but the, this can also have, uh, you know, in effect, we look at other factors such as levels of iron, or, or hypoxia within the cells. Uh, you know, secondly, we know that there's a large diversity of modifications, but there's still some challenges when it comes to mapping modifications and measuring stoichiometry. Uh, so you know, with my chemistry background, I'd really like to uh, develop quantitative approaches to characterize these modifications. Uh, so uh, using my background in mass spectrometry, as well as some of these newer technologies like nanopore sequencing to really uh, get at uh, and characterize what uh, these modifications are doing uh, in the cells. Uh, and then finally, you know, one of the things that's really interesting is, you know, again, I've spoken to you today about one modification, uh, but we know that there are many modifications. Uh, and so how do these modifications synergize or antagonize each other to exert their effects in cells? Uh, and so taken together, I think these approaches will allow us to really uh, develop a more nuanced understanding uh, of some of this metabolic uh, RNA regulatory pathways. Uh, and so finally, I'd like to take a moment and acknowledge uh, Dr. Pedro Batista, who's a wonderful mentor, uh, as well as other members of the Batista lab, uh, in particular, uh, Dr. Mariana Mandler has been a lot of help on this project, uh, as well as the rest of uh, the LCB for being a wonderful place to do science. Uh, I'd like to thank our collaborators in the Mass Spec and the Genomics Corps, uh, as well as postdoctoral funding from the American Cancer Society, uh, and uh, Leading Edge as well, again, for uh, allowing me a, a opportunity to share my work with you today. Uh, so I've included my contact information at the bottom, uh, but of course I'd always also be very, very happy to answer any questions that you have here today. Thank you. Thank you very much, Christina. That was a really great talk. Um, are there any questions? We have time for a couple of questions. Feel free to raise your hand or uh, write it in the chat. Um, maybe I can start with a kind of a broad question just out of curiosity. I was uh, wondering if you could tell us a bit about this crosstalk between different uh, types of uh, RNA modifications um, and whether you see any changes of other modifications in the cell line that you were looking at. Yes. So, so um, not just M6A, but interaction with others. Yeah, so primarily I've been focused on uh, looking at M6A, uh, although uh, I've been interested uh, kind of more recently in looking at uh, crosstalk with uh, M6A and one of these other common modifications of uh, the M5C, the, the 5 methyl Um So the, the work is still quite preliminary. Uh, we've been uh, kind of looking at the role of, of these uh, and interested in, in how they might be talking to each other. Uh, you know. Uh, We've also been interested as well in some of these other uh, RNA uh, demethylase enzymes uh, because they would also be inhibited by some of these uh, fumarate and succinate accumulation. Uh, and so we've been looking at how uh, tRNA modifications might be changing um, as well. Uh, so that work is still ongoing. Uh, so I, I don't have any good answers for you yet, but um, you know, it, it is something that we're definitely interested in. Are there any other questions? There's a question from Grace Kenny. 
um, are the writer eraser systems that connect to other metabolic systems uh, for example, maybe acetylations, which would depend on uh, AC-CoA, and have you been looking at them? Yeah, so, so one of the projects that we've been uh, thinking about in the lab, uh, as well as is some of these uh, changes in s adenosomethionine, so the methyl donor, um, there are uh, other labs that look at uh, acetyl-CoA um, and, and the role that that plays, um, and they're doing great work. Um, so Jordan Myers lab. Um, at the NCI also looks at, um, you know, acetyl-CoA. Okay, if there are uh, no more questions, we're right on time. So thank you very much uh, to all the speakers for really great talks. Thank you to all the attendees. Um, Thank you for joining us today. Um, and we hope to see you again for our next session, which will take place this coming Monday, uh, Monday, July 11th at uh, 12 noon uh, Eastern, nine Pacific, uh, covering genomics and developmental biology. And just to remind you that we have leading edge uh, sessions every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday throughout July. So we look forward to seeing you there as well. Thank you very much.